Good morning. It is Monday, July 18th, 2022, and welcome to Savannah Community Headlines Live. And it's a weekly chat around the virtual water cooler with change makers in the Savannah area. We are streaming on multiple social media platforms this morning. I'm your host, Marjorie Young, and today we're talking about the Savannah Philharmonic. Take a listen to this short video. The 2022-23 season of the Savannah Philharmonic was created with the concept of presenting music for the sake of music. As the soundtrack of Savannah, we want music to bring the community together. We are truly excited to be popping up in local neighborhoods and at the Lucas Theater. With new and accessible pricing, there is certainly something for everyone. And I want to give a special welcome to our music and artistic director, Keitaro Harara, and executive director, Amy Williams. Welcome to the Water Cooler. And Good morning. Thanks for morning. having us. Yeah, absolutely. The Savannah Philharmonic has a lot of different um, updates this year, a lot of positive changes. But before we get into all the positive changes that you just talked about on the, um, on the video, I want to hear more about how you both got interested in music and orchestra music. Hey, Taro. Oh, I shall start. Um, I am born and raised in Japan, and I come from a completely non-musical family. I, um, I grew up listening to like pop and rock and roll. Um, my family loved listening to Beatles, Stevie Wonder, and so for me to be in this world of classical music is very very um just like unimaginable but that being said my background of loving the pop culture has really really um helped me in my career so when i was little i was taken to a ballet of i think it must have been nutcracker or something but then i like completely slept through it and then so my family thought oh probably classical music is not a thing for this child but i started um the saxophone um during the late years of my um, grade school and just absolutely fell in love with it and then i thought it was really cool and then i saw west side story the musical um that was presented by my school and i thought wow i really want to become something in this world of beautiful art making and theatrical um aspects of music and you know theater and so started off as saxophonist i really wanted to be in broadway playing in the pit playing multiple different instruments um in fact really what i wanted to do was be on stage and be a musical star but i have like zero talent when it comes to singing and dancing so that just was a failed failed dream but regardless i wanted to be in the pit and one thing led to another i ended up being going to an arts high school in michigan um and and that's where i got into conducting and so um instead of being an instrumentalist in a pit i ended up becoming an opera conductor um and then i conduct symphonies and i'm also a graduate of mercer university so i have um a soft place in my heart for the state of georgia because that is where i did make a lot of my training and i'm just happy to be back in the state of Georgia, in this wonderful community of Savannah, where I can make music. Wonderful. Dr. Williams, how about you? So similar to today, I am not from a musical background uh, at all. My family is not uh, musical. My dad sang barbershop quartet, um, but you know that doesn't quite correspond to orchestral music, but Growing up in a really small town in Massachusetts, you know, every every July 4, everyone in Massachusetts, or at least I feel like everyone in Massachusetts, would watch the Boston Pops. 
on the 4th of July. And so when I was really little, I thought the coolest instrument was the piccolo because the piccolo player got to stand up and play um, during Stars and Stripes with fireworks, right? And that, that was, to me was the coolest thing. So when I had the opportunity in this little town to play an instrument, I picked up, I, I chose to play the um, but was was really that child that never practiced at all. Oh God! Um, I say at all. It was at all. Um, really, at one point, my parents kept wanting to me to practice, and right, like the microwave timer was set for twenty minutes every other day. And even then, I considered just recording myself once and just hitting play on a tape recorder so that I didn't actually have to do it. Um, <laughs> but you know, all my friends would receive letters home of your child should play a different instrument, your child should not play an instrument, doesn't have musical ability. And mine just kept going home of like, your child needs to actually practice, your child needs to do something. Um, but when I got to middle school, and I would say it was it was really peer pressure, right? So I got to a middle school, again, small town, um, but now five towns went to one regional middle school and high school. So everyone around me could play. And there I was in seventh grade, not really, knowing what a half note was um, or how to finger any of the notes. Um, so I walked up to the same music teacher and said, hey, um, you know, I'd like to take some lessons and learn. And uh, he was the one that dealt with me from fourth grade through six. And I, he just gave me this look that, was like, okay. Um, you know, after a lesson, long lecture of that I have to practice, I was like, no, I understand that. Um, took lessons from a high school teacher, at a high school flute player at that point because the commitment, my commitment was low. So what, who, who should believe in this child that now suddenly needs to practice? Um, but then got a bassoon in my hands in eighth grade because I didn't know what it was, um, right? Like the band director stood up in front of everyone and said, you know, want someone to play the oboe or bassoon from the flute and clarinet section because we had too many of us. Um, and I just raised my hand to play the bassoon, had no idea what it was brought this instrument home to my family who had no idea what it was. And we, you know, I knew at that point how to put it together and take it apart. But even then, if you've seen the bassoon, there's five pieces to it. It doesn't really make sense. Um, so we, after I showed my parents and I just showed up to them and with this instrument and showed them, and then I had to take it to my grandparents' house to show my grandmother that what instrument I was playing, and then to my aunt and uncles, and then to my other grandparents' house. So, you know, by the time it houses, I could put it together, take it apart, and maybe play a scale. But from the point I had that instrument in my hands, I, I just, I fell in love with it um, and went to college for ed music education and performance, really not knowing what a performance degree was. Because again, my parents and I, we were learning this together. Um, and they were great in driving me to Boston for rehearsals and to um, UMass Amherst for rehearsals and UMass Amherst area for lessons with my I'm an amazing bassoon teacher there. Um, but it was still a discovery. So when I went to college, it was, of course, I'd major in music education and performance. And, you know, after about a semester, I called my parents and I said, I'd like to just drop education and see what, what performance would lead me to. Um, and and after some conversation, uh, they they agreed to that. And um, I know now that they called my teacher after that conversation, my high school teacher after that conversation, to ask her what what their child was about to do. Um, but that's what sort of led me through school, led me um, into my doctorate, and and led me to to leading orchestras. That's a, you both have such fascinating backgrounds and. Look where you all are today. You are changing the landscape of Savannah. So let's talk to me about the importance of community and pulling community together with music. You know, as Savannah Philharmonic, we are, you know, the orchestra, the Philharmonic of the community. And Amy and I stress a lot about how relevant can we be to Savannah? You know, every any orchestra can do the typical things like doing a concert, putting on educational programs, doing, you know, pops concerts, holiday concerts, the Messiah. But what makes 
each orchestra special about each community is how relevant we are. What what can we as Savannah Philharmonic do that only Savannah Philharmonic can do in Savannah? And you know, we live in a great city where it's thriving, it's growing. Um, it's not just a downtown area. We have outskirts of the Savannah proper that are just blossoming. And so we, you know, when we first came, we, we both sort of came at the same time to Savannah. We sort of just yeah. knew downtown. But then as we spend more time in this community, we learn that it's not just about downtown. There's so much more and so much more potential and wish for classical music or any type of music to be performed live in different communities. And so that's sort of where we have sort of changed the mindset of what this Philharmonic needs to be. And I will leave it to Amy to fill the rest. Yeah, and I, for, for me, it's, it's how do we, rather than what can we give to the community? It's what does the community need from us? Like from what Kay was saying. So right, like mm -hmm. everything comes back to what does it mean to be a community driven arts organization? So not an arts organization for the community, but a community driven arts organization. And that's really where, where it's interesting and what, you know, where we've built and really changed the landscape. And I want to say here also, and it, it sort of comes back, you know, and I think about it, like it's, for Kay and I, I mean, you heard from our background, for us, it's personal. Um, it's really a personal feeling um, that we want to be that community-driven organization, right? Like, I'm from the little town in Massachusetts. We didn't go into Boston, right? So it's it, it's what is Savannah, what is not just the city of Savannah, but what is the region of Savannah? And how do we reach the region of Savannah to feel like everyone um, has access to us? Your video said that you'll be popping up in neighborhoods. Talk to me about that. Sure. Um, we're starting our season with what it's called the Neighborhood Series Concerts. And we are taking three weekends in a row in September, um, Friday, Rather Saturday, and Sunday. And then each week we are um, presenting a different arts organization in Savannah, from Savannah. And we wanted to do it this way because we didn't want to just present just us, but we wanted to highlight different arts or different forms of music that can be heard in Savannah. So the first week we're um, featuring the Savannah Jazz Festival where we'll be performing um, at Isle of Hope, Kensington Park, and Windsor Forest. The second week we are featuring um, the Voice Festival where we're doing um, performances at Arsley Hall Park, the Yacht Club, um, as an example. And then in the third week, we are bringing a blues artist um, from Clarksdale, Mississippi, who's going to be performing with members of the Savannah Philharmonic, where we'll be performing um, at Fairway Oaks, Greenville, uh, Greenview Park, Tanger Outlet, and then also at the Habersham Woods at YMCA Habersham. So nine different locations that we've I don't think in the recent years we really performed at. Um, and in each of these nine neighborhoods, it's exciting because they're excited about having the Philharmonic there. Um, you know, Amy and I visited different places, all of these places, and it's just, it's great to hear that they want live music. Yeah. Amy, to you. And, and I love how you're blending it too. It's yeah. not, it's music. What's this, you call it the soundtrack of Savannah? Music yeah. for sake of music. I mean, it's it's music. Yeah. And I would say, you know, it's not a, it's really a collaboration and a partnership with these neighborhoods. Like, right, like it's not a formal concert, right? You're not going to have to come at a certain time and sit and be quiet and, and all of that. We are literally in streets in some locations, in parks on some locations, um, on front porches. Uh, and it's, it's this feeling that like, we live in Savannah, so let's be part of this. And, and a key component of this is that it all leads up to fill the park, which used to be known as Picnic in the Park, which is on a Saturday this year. And one of the and that was a really um, conscious deci decision that we made to put it on a Saturday because what we heard from a lot of the community members that it was always on a Sunday night, but right, like families couldn't go, and there were there were challenges. It was a work night. It was a school night. So to move it to a Saturday, we have this opportunity, like more people can come and just, again, just come hang out with us 
and and mm -hmm. see what out. And, and it ends up being a lot more fun that way. And and the other thing that we're adapting fill the park some, you know, we heard that it would end so late. And now it actually ends at 8 30. We have significant lighting for the park. So it's we've just sort of we spent some time listening to the community and to be a community focused arts organization, we had to make some changes internally to do that. And you know, this is quite difficult or in in many ways because you know Savannah is filled with traditions mm -hmm. and picnicking in a park was such a tradition that it was always on a Sunday. It was always at this time of the hour. And you know that in, you know, Marjorie, you've been in this community long enough to know that when you change a tradition, everyone raised hell about it. But, you know, Amy and I were like, well, we're new, so we're just going to change it and see how it goes. And we're not afraid that people are going to be upset. But a lot of people are actually excited about it because then they can actually bring their family. And it's on a football night, so I'm just going to announce scores from the stage. That's a good idea. That's yeah, being exactly. part of the community. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So who who is the main sponsor for that this year? For we were excited how I mean, of course, the city of Savannah is always um, a lead sponsor, but alongside them is Colonial. The Colonial Group. The Colonial Group is alongside them. So we're excited to have them out and, and joining us for that. And, you know, and we also have some other amazing sponsors, um, uh, Stacey Donegan Real Estate and, um, and, and the list goes on. So. So I heard there were some more changes that like when you perform at the Lucas, um, you're, you're still trying to make everybody feel inclusive and you're trying to make it accessible for everybody price-wise. So talk to me about what you're wearing, how much it costs. Go ahead, Amy. You, okay. So um, again, like it just goes back, like for me, this community-focused arts organization, we can't have concerts that people can't afford, that the greater community cannot afford to attend, right? So we have tickets as low as $29 and to $69, which is a significant change. And then, you know, you know, we have subscriptions. We're going to be doing some new things with subscriptions soon. So everyone should stay tuned for that. But we also have student tickets um, that, and a student subscription that could be as low as $8. Um, student tickets for individual concerts are $10. But the, the neat thing about our student tickets is this, that, Normally, a student ticket is only for certain sections of the orchestra, of the hall, right? So a student can't sit just anywhere. But for our student tickets, it's really open to anywhere. So with a student ID, wow. everyone can sit anywhere. Like, so if a parent wants, if mom or dad wants to come and sit in $69 seats and bring their child, their child's $10, right? So there's a real key component to this um, to just make it easier so it doesn't always have to be like babysitters are expensive and right and, and even if your child's old enough like you might not want to leave your 14 or 15 year old home by themselves or maybe they're into music and they want to come so so those are some different things um that we have there and then in addition um the orchestra is not in tuxedos um they're in black suits or or long black for the women and this again was a conscious decision that orchestras we again want to represent the community we live in. Not everyone owns a tuxedo. Uh, I always make the joke that my husband did not buy a tuxedo until he married me because we went to events and he had to wear it. So it's this idea of that we want everyone to feel like they don't have to dress up super formal to come to a concert. Um, if they would like to, they are more than welcome to, right? Like we're not going to stop anyone from, from wearing a tuxedo or wearing a, a, a suit to a concert. But if someone doesn't own a suit or they're not comfortable or their suit no longer fits because they wear it once a year, um, right. they can they can come and just feel comfortable. And then there's this tradition, there's this new trend going on in the orchestras around the world of the axing the tux tuxedo in the former dressing out attire, but then saving it for special moments like the gala okay. or like you know some kind of a season opener. So we want to. We're, you know, we're not completely getting rid of the tuxedo in, in that sense, but there will be moments that we would have that kind of an event for um, special occasions. But for in general, we want the community to be um, feel welcome and then not have to worry about 
what the, what they have to wear to a concert. And then in that same token, our programming is also sort of catered towards that way, where we used to, um, and then this is a typical thing that orchestras do around the nation is that there's like a classical series and then there's also a pop series. So there's, you know, categorization of music. Well, Amy and I don't like categorization of music, so we just got rid of it. Music for the sake of music. So in our season, you can come to a concert where you'll be hearing, you know, Brahms symphony, and then you can hear come to a concert where you're hearing you know, Johnny Mercer, or there's even watching the movie of Home Alone in a big screen at Lucas Theater while the orchestra performs live, while, you know, we all watch together the Home Alone movie. Um, there is Bernstein, and there's Gershwin, and there's also a Rachmaninoff, you know, connected to a, diff a, a world premiere composed by Robin Beauchamp, who's a composer in town. So it is a crockpot of a lot of different things and then you know who doesn't like a crock pot so and let me go ahead amy well and our program notes build off of this right so the the notes that you read will not be that formal um music historian element right so it's it's yes we have a musician writing them but it's 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 going to be elements that he finds fun or things that he might think are interesting so so again, it's just this, everything is from a personal standpoint. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the importance of early education and music and the influence it has on students. Well, I think Kay and I are prime examples of early music education that it has on students, right? Neither one of us are really from formal music backgrounds um, or families, families with musical families, backgrounds families, yeah. right? we have formal music backgrounds but we don't have families that that had that training so so for me um music education and our community initiatives are a key component of what we do because you never know what child is going to discover something or when they're going to discover it right like i literally did not practice until I hit seventh grade. And then it was really sort of practicing until I got a bassoon in my hands. Um, so it was a music teacher that kept me going. So what we wanna make sure in town is that we're providing support for the music teacher. We will never take over that, that position, right? They're doing all they can in those classrooms. But for the music educators out there, like we just wanna be alongside them and help and, and help them introduce the instruments to the orchestra so that kids can touch them so that we can help all students across Savannah um, audition and feel good about themselves when they're auditioning for either their high school or um, GMEA, which is the Georgia Music Educators Association um, programs and things. So it's taking that component. And then, you know, and there's this whole element of, of music providing the emotional outlet, right? outlet, right, the socio-emotional element of music. When you walk into a band, we believe, like our programs are built to being that a child is a child. So, right, so if every child setting up is set up for success, then they are, have all have that. So, right, there's no element of who has what. And that's just so prominent, not just in Savannah, but in our in our culture. So, yeah. And then the Savannah Philharmonic started a, a lending library, the Ben Tucker. Talk to me about that. Yeah, yeah. and and that's a, one of the components is the Ben Tucker Music um, Instrument Library that if there's a student at a school that doesn't have access to a quality instrument, right? So one that 100% works and yeah. they qualify like through free or reduced lunch and through some, some applications that we have we will make sure they have an instrument. And not only that they'll have an instrument, but they'll be have the materials they need for that instrument. And they will have the instruction they need for that instrument if it's not available at their school. So there's a whole element to that. And as long as they're playing, as long as they're meeting the targets, um, then then we'll continue supporting that that child up through, through the program. So we're really excited by that um, because Rental costs are expensive. Reads are expensive. Equipment's expensive. Um, and it, so it adds up for families. When my daughter was really small, like I think she was four or five, um, I read a study saying that if you play music, 
you'll be better at math. So I said, you get to select any instrument you want. And she <laughs> selected a violin. And we started the Suzuki method mm -hmm. in, in kindergarten. And she immediately started playing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And there must be something to it because she's got a PhD in robotics engineering now. I mean, yeah. there, there has, I mean, there is a lot of truth to that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, music triggers a different part of the brain that is not so, you know, conveniently in your daily life if you don't play music. And so starting young is starting music young is always a beneficial aspect, but it doesn't have to be youth that um, youth and music education doesn't have to always be synonymous. Like you could start music at a later age and still gain a lot of um, captive oh, elements yeah. of what you know, music education has to offer. But what we've been doing in Savannah Philharmonic, this is our second year doing um, the summer program at Horizons. And um, it's just amazing to see children who touch the instrument for the first time, make mm -hmm. a sound for the first time, and then get this get these trainings um, throughout the summer to play a song or a tune. And just it just enlightens, you know, everything that was so new to them. And that's what we're also so seeking because when we find someone who is absolutely passionate about music, but maybe doesn't have the and you know funds to do the music lessons or mm -hmm. buy an instrument, that's where the Savannah Philharmonic can come in to assist for their musical training and then for their musical desire for their you know school years. So we want to be that source of music education funding that is not easily accessible. And then what we want to achieve is that we want to be able to touch every student in our community through music. That's, you, you just had the all-star ensemble, right? Mm -hmm. We um, This was our first time doing the all-star ensemble this past May, where we basically invited every high school band director to recommend students. So usually um, if you have, you know, every city, every state has an all-star, uh, all-state ensemble or a regional ensemble, regional band, regional orchestra, regional chorus that leads up to an all-state band, orchestra, and chorus. And this is purely merit-based, audition-based. But what we did at the all-star ensemble at the Sab Phil is that we did it ba purely based on recommendation. Who in your classroom loves music and would love to play with other people? No audition necessary. And we really didn't know who we're going to get or what we're going to get. But what we ended up getting was just an amazing group of students of all ages that came together and they got to sit next to the Savannah Philharmonic players. They rehearsed several hours with me on one day and then we performed together a concert that was just absolutely beautiful. And in, in I don't know, Amy, how would you just like, I didn't em envision all of that to happen. I had sort of an idea that it would be a success, but like, you know, it, tell, tell me, tell us about your experience. I think the seeing summer. All that. The summary of it and watching it, right? And someone would say, you know, well, what is the All Star Ensemble about? And and I think to summarize it, it's playing great music and making new friends, right? So it's this case expectation of everyone was the same. Our um, musicians had the same expectation of it, and really, we just saw these kids come together and hang out and different schools and. Um, I, one of the music stores was there, and, and I think it was really in, when they were hanging out before the concert, they were handed out kazoos, and we didn't even know that that was happening. Mm -hmm. And then you saw like all these little kazoo bands going on. Um, a lot of music kazoos, is music. Music is music. Kazoos are loud, yeah. but yeah. but it was just it was just a lot of fun, and it was I would say it was it was easy because it was really really. Mm -hmm come down to that fundamental of playing great music and making new friends. What, um, what we also had was a coupling of the day before we had the Savannah Philharmonic concert, the season finale in May, where we were at the Luke Theater performing Scheherazade. And, and so these students that came to the All-Star Ensemble also had an opportunity to see their teachers perform 
you know, with the professional ensemble the night before, and then their parents came too. And so mm -hmm. it was just a nice, you know, transition into, oh, wow, you know, they just performed a major concert last night. And then here they are sitting next to us playing together on mm -hmm. these, these tunes. And it was just, it was just really, really nice. It was fun. Mm -hmm. what, what is that phenomenon when you listen to music and it gives you chill bumps or it makes you cry? What, what is that? Hmm. I think it's just triggering something in us, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and I would say there's any, any song, any piece, any form or genre of music can, mm -hmm. can do that, right? Like it's, it triggers a memory. It triggers something yes. you may not even know, but, I, but for mm -hmm. us, like, um, it just gives us that, that emotional response and, mm -hmm. and, you know, we can choose to lean into that or we can choose to be like, huh, that's interesting. Like we need to move on. But it's such a wonderful form of communication without words. I mean, it can communicate happy, sad, angry. I mean, it, it's a wonderful way to connect the community. Mm -hmm through another form of communication actually so yeah what we you know what also music allows us to do is you know especially when we're working with young musicians and students is that through any piece of music you can relate to other aspects of their education like a music can have history it can we can talk about composers mm -hmm. when that composer lived he or she um you know compose this music at what city or what country and then we talk about geography we talk about you know the scientific aspects of harmony and then why something sounds great together why it doesn't sound great together we talk about physics about tuning and so there's just it's when people say oh it's just music or when you know it's just the subject of music there's just so much more underlying layers to music than just music there's literature, there's science, there's arts, there's, you know, everything that you can imagine that you learn in the school subject is all within that music that you perform. And there's just an educational aspect from, for us mentors to share all of that. And, and for students, it's just like mind, mind blowing, I think, because there's so much more than they had expected than just playing a few notes here and there and counting one, two, three, four. So I've got a question. Please. I've always wanted to ask this. Now I know a conductor. What's the history behind the white wand? And mm -hmm. what are you doing? I mean, I guess you're playing. <laughs> sure. Um, back in music history, like back a couple hundred years ago, there was no conductor. Um, you know, music was performed maybe with like a very small ensemble, like a quartet or a trio. So they didn't need anyone to lead the group. And then as composers start to get more ambitious with their music and a lot of people got interested in playing music, then the ensemble got bigger. And so it required someone to keep time. And so back in the day, they would play this beautiful music, but there would be a person standing right in front of them with a stick stomping on the ground like boom 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 <laughs> boom boom really loud too loud you would hear the stick and not the music well when you read about when you read the history books they would often talk about how loud this stomping was that they couldn't really hear the music and it was just ridiculous until this one person who was doing this stabbed himself in his foot and died and they completely got rid of that tradition and said enough is enough like let's not disturb the music and then it became music showing music and time and phrasing through their hands now you can do that when you're you know when there's maybe like 10 or 20 people in front of you but then as composers throughout history started to compose for a larger scale orchestra. And when you have like hundred people in front of you or 80 people in front of you, and there's a huge distance, then they needed something to, to ex as an extension of their arm. And then that's where that white stick came around. Um, what is it made out of? So it could be made out of anything. Um, mine particularly is made out of wood that is easily breakable. And, and that's a key, key reason why 
it's easily breakable. Some batons, like some some fancy batons, are made out of like fiberglass and it's unbreakable. But I've seen a performance where a conductor has stabbed their hand straight through because the stick didn't break, or someone who has stabbed their their eye once, and it was just like the most disturbing thing on the planet. Yes. And and if it's if it's a stick, if it's a wood, it's gonna break. And I love breaking my baton because if it if it hit, hits me, it's gonna break and it's not gonna kill me. And so, is so it, does it mean good luck maybe? Or I mean. <sighs> Who knows? But like, I just don't want to kill myself with, while conducting. What kind of a sad story is that? <laughs> There's already been a death with a conducting baton. Like, I don't need to be, you know, that, really? that second person. Yeah. So, so, anyways, the, the stick is just—it's an extension, and it, it it says a lot of different things. But um, do you give it, it away afterwards, or do you reuse it? I reuse mine, but like I also lose mine a lot too. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a stick. It doesn't really make the music. But it is. Um, I always wanted to ask that question. And do you, is it? Are your movements written in the music, or is it impromptu? No, nothing. Nothing. The choreography of the movement is absolutely. There's nothing written in the music of it, um, which makes everyone very unique. And then, in fact, like every instrumentalist, when Amy plays her bassoon, the the way one should phrase a melody is not written in it. It's just it's inspired by what is what feels most natural to that player. And so, conducting is the same way. We have this score which has the notes, but it doesn't say move your right arm from here. 20 degrees to the left to this way okay. it just you know it just and how you move is just so is very each person is very unique right but then from my component right so if i'm playing bassoon and i'm watching k conduct then i my job is to react to his movement so that everyone in the orchestra is responding in the same manner um to that to that movement to that expression and knowing, right, like it's it's literally this sort of call and response with no words, and it's mm -hmm. it's figuring out that it's watching the concert master's bow, um, and to keep time and, and all of that. So there's a there's a play, there's a call and response between the conductor and the orchestra. And, you know, there's always the jokes that the orchestra orchestral mus musicians just pull their stand up, watch the concert master, and do what they want, and don't watch the conductor. Which happens in some cases, but uh. which happens a lot. And then you can really, when you watch an orchestra either live or when you watch an orchestra on TV or YouTube, you can really feel the dynamic of oh, this orchestra doesn't like this conductor. Oh, this orchestra really likes this conductor because you can yeah. just see the energy of it. It's you know, when you it's give a speech, energy. yeah, when you give a speech to a crowd, you can tell if you're if you've grabbed their heart or if you have, you know, if you've completely yeah. lost their interest. And, so. for, the, and for the music, for the orchestra players, like, right, it, it's a job. So they've already played the piece. They know how to play it. Mm -hmm. and they can just choose very quickly to execute differently than what's being given to them. And right. Like a K as a conductor would, will literally know when that happens. And there's nothing that you can do to stop it, really. No. And it also goes, you know, it depends on day by day because that person, like if there's 80 people in front of us and there's one person who's just very disinterested, it may have nothing to do with you. It could be that that person had a bad day. That person may have started the day with, you know, a fight with a family member and it's just not in a mood to be sitting there in front of you. And you have zero control over that. So, you know, I... I myself like never get really caught caught into reading pe too too much into people's minds. If they like it, great. If they don't like it, great. <laughs> you know, it's when, you're up, when you're up there and you turn around and you face the audience, there's all these spotlights. Can yeah. you even see anybody? No, this is the great part about the spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> Blinded by the light, literally. Yeah. So well, I, can, I can hear the applause, which is great, and so like I really appreciate the energy <laughs> so from the audience. Yeah, yeah. But the but the other thing is, you know, like during the during 
one of the great things about performing live is that energy that you feel in the concert hall. Like when we came oh, back yeah. to Lucas Theater back in this February and was able to perform for our, you know, our fans in that hall, there was just this sense of homecoming. And for Amy, who came came in as an executive director, she had never performed at the Luca Theater because when she came was in the midst of the pandemic. So so for her it was homecoming, but to a home that she had never been to. <laughs> so what's the largest audience you have ever performed in front of? Okay. And I uh largest, I think. I have to think about that. Uh live probably twenty thousand people. Wow. Yeah. Outdoor concert, not indoors. Yeah. But outdoor. Yeah. How about the you? Largest, the largest I experienced was when Savannah Philharmonic had the opportunity to be on stage with the Eagles. And right, like, and I'm so glad I took the opportunity to sing in the chorus for that because I had never, you know, I'm used to the concert halls being 1600 max um, for the organizations that I've, I've both been on stage with performing and um, been been running it um and i when i moved here i came from a chamber music organization so our halls were 250 um so it was just a different thing but i so i think that was that was really like and there was such energy in that right so but really for me um outside of that the largest thing that i'll experience um will be fill the park in in october um and and again it's it, to have the opportunity to walk on the stage with Kay and and welcome everyone and, and just sort of take it in. But, you know, yes. Yes. It'll, it'll be amazing. But I'll also, you know, kind of sneak way to the back at some point during that and take in the whole, whole thing from the experience. Because I just, for me, it's about everyone coming together through music and that togetherness through music. So there's nothing quite like it than a full orchestra on stage, a large audience, right? We have the chorus there and, and just that that energy and feeling and and like what Kay was saying, like the orchestra will feed off of it, right? Like everyone sort of feeds off of it from one another because once it starts, it's just it's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's an energy. So before we wrap up, I want to ask each of you, what is your favorite piece of music to conduct? Or, or, yeah, or play, <sighs> or just whatever. For me, I. If it has to be classical music, I would say Puccini's Bohème. It's mm -hmm. an opera. Um, it was the first opera that I had encountered and absolutely fell in love and went into um, that field. So Bohème would be my desert island piece. If it doesn't have to be classical mm -hmm. music, and I really don't listen to much classical music, um, so like my my playlist is usually like I'm still stuck in my like high school love song days of like Casey and Jojo and Backstreet Boys and like NSYNC so like like that you know it's so interesting Britney Spears and like I love I love the I love that early 2000 music yeah. of just pops and you know it just brings me back to you know, the good old times. That's so interesting. I always wanted to ask, you know, do you just listen to classical? My Spotify playlist doesn't have classical music on it. It's <laughs> all jazz or rock or oldies or pops. So interesting. Interesting. Yeah. How about you, Amy? Um, my favorite classical piece is, um, and it's both like, Again, going back to that, the power of a full orchestra and chorus, and it's Verdi Requiem. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll never forget the first time I played it. I sat next to my high school teacher, um, and and she would hit me every time what a part came on that she liked, right? Like every time, like she'd like listen to this stuff, listen. and <laughs> right, like I'm getting like smacked in the leg through the entire concert. But it was so. It was so much fun because it was the first time that I sat in an orchestra that large. I was in college. I was an undergrad, but I was early, it was early in college. So probably mm -hmm. freshman or sophomore year. And I sat in an orchestra at large with a massive chorus behind us and just the wall of sound. 
that came through and right as a bassoonist I'm, bumps. i felt like lucky to sit in the middle of it um and that's one that i always think of that i you know when i talk to my friends and i talk to people that have never experienced sitting on orchestra i'm like i want to put everyone in the middle of an orchestra with a chorus around them and to feel that because there's you can't describe it um so that's really my my favorite my favorite piece um and then you know there's for like k i don't listen to any classical music <laughs> my iPod. um and so i i run and i do lots of things and um, everyone likes to say like, oh, you must only listen to classical music on a long run. Like, no, <laughs> Not at all. And, and the whole world of music. It's it's pop music. I am a fan. If I can learn a pop song within basically like one and a half listenings and I know all the words in that amount of time, it will be on my iPod. It'll be in my playlist. Um, and I absolutely love it. And I will actually admit that I'm also the person that like a high school kid, like I'll hit repeat. And I'll make it play several times in a row. So. <laughs> I found music has energy. I get it. I get it. I mean, if I need to yeah. get excited about something, I'll, I'll put on something that has that kind of energy. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. music has, yeah. music yeah, I, has. I can't run to classical music. So no, there's no way. <laughs> Yeah. Well, first of all, like the the edge the the musician side of the brain starts kicking in, and like you have to like start um, thinking about it, and it's it's just it's just it's just bad, um, <laughs> <laughs> or else you're just gonna get hit by a truck or something. <laughs> this has just been such an interesting conversation. Uh, learning more about your backgrounds and and more about the the music industry. So thank you so much for taking time to share your lives with with the uh, viewers and um thank you for all the positive changes happening in the savannah area and to wrap up amy how do people get in touch with you how do they buy season tickets how do they find out more information sure uh, for more information anyone can give our office a call at 912-232-6002 um, or you know follow us on social media um, and mm -hmm. go to our website savannahphilharmonic.org any last um, parting words of what you want savannah to know sure um if you've never been to a savannah philharmonic the first time to check it out is at Phil the Park at Forsyth Park in October. Um, and I think it is just a great way to bring your friends and families, bring a picnic and just hear live music with yeah. thousands of other people. It's on October 8th, starting at, you know, in mid afternoon around 4 p.m. And I if you like, if you like that, then try another one the next month and if you like that try again and then as you feel like okay maybe this is something for me then then subscribe because then that way you get a huge discount on the tickets and then there's something for you to attend every month and i think that's just a great way to learn more about what's in store for live music that you can experience with your partner your spouse your family you know or, or with mm -hmm. even with friends it can be an outing grab a dinner come to come to the philharmonic and then just let us give yeah. you some kind of an entertainment and we want to be the source of entertainment for everyone yeah are the tickets, um on your phone are the tickets digital i would imagine yes the, di the tickets you can either pull up on your phone or it's or it's print from home we're not uh, mm -hmm. so it's it's pretty easy but i'd also add to what um kay was saying you know we have musicians in the schools and in the lobbies of hospitals and the um libraries right now like we're we're all over town so i would just my parting words would just be to feel free to come say hi um you know you can see from this conversation we're all just people i think for sometimes um classical musicians definitely have this very element of like oh i can't talk to them i don't know enough from them but, Kay and I just admitted that we have pop music from 2000 on our iPods and our playlist. So mm -hmm. I, w come say hi. Come say hi. Absolutely. Yep. Most definitely. All right, guys. Well, it's time to <laughs> get back to, to work and head to Rotary for me. <laughs> so anyhow, thank you so much for being on here. And um, we will talk to everybody soon. Talk to you soon. Thank Thanks, you. Marjorie. Thank you.